Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sin. Hi, last protagonist. Hello, everyone. Wait, wait, wait. That's my line. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're just supposed to say hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snap Covenant, episode 243. Today, we have a very special guest with us for a very special topic. The topic is Kegare. And Sophie, yes. when I think about Kegare, do you know what comes to mind? Shut up! <laughs> so, last protagonist, most people know who you are. However, there's a couple of people who sub to our channel to listen to our analysis of MD Geist. Mm -hmm. So for the benefit of those people, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself? My internet handle is Last Protagonist. I am a Soulsborne enthusiast. I also speak Japanese, so I've been using that avenue to re-examine Soulsborne lore and try to give extra context that isn't necessarily immediately available into the games just to see whether it can reconfirm some common conceptions about the games or redefine what we may think that we know. With that being said, Bloodborne is more of my specialty and it's only been more recently that I've been really trying to take the deeper dives into like Dark Souls lore. Thank you. Now let me ask you, why do you need to know Japanese if the script was written in English first? Ooh, asking the hard-hitting questions. <laughs> well, you see there's North American English, which I'm a little more familiar with, and then there's like British English and Australian English, so it really needs multiple uh, perspectives to put it all together. Yeah, like when I play Bloodborne, the Yanamites actually just yell, Oi, can't! <laughs> <laughs> So, let's move on to today's topic. Today, we're going to talk about Kegare. I think every time we say Kegare, we should all take a shot. We need to have a little Kegare alarm down the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the Kegare counter? Kegare counter, yeah, something like that. That's a good idea. <laughs> and I guess the first question is, what is Kegare? With Kegare, it's a Japanese concept that's related to Shintoism, mostly. There might be ties like Buddhism. It's kind of hard to unravel all of that stuff sometimes. I've researched it a little bit, but there's still quite a lot of things that I don't know. But generally, Kegare is related to this idea of coming into contact with impurity. I, I think it would be the way that I'd probably translate that a bit more consistently into English. Like That doesn't capture like the full meaning of it, but generally... If you become impure, it impedes your ability to kind of exist in accordance with the way of, of nature and uh, Shinto, like the way of the gods. So uh, coming into contact with impure elements, whether that be blood or death or decay, those are all really big elements of Kegare, and they just prevent somebody from being able to live in accordance with nature, I guess. Because Shinto literally means like the way of gods. And gods or kami, they don't like Kigare. So if you're Kigare, you can't really talk to them. Yes. Just to quickly address like the idea of kami, I think one issue for like a lot of Western people is trying to like wrap their minds around the idea of kami because we don't really have good ways to translate that idea in the language itself. We just have like deities is one way to think of it. Quite often people will say like uh, Shintoism is like an animistic religion which is it's kind of true mm. but i would almost say it's like more spiritual than just like animism because uh if you believe in the idea that like uh there's uh, an essence of something it's kind of within everything but it doesn't necessarily have to be like a living essence so uh, this will be kind of like a little silly of an example i suppose but if you just think of like a tree if you think of a really really good tree a grand tree like a tree that you can uh enjoy the shade of with your children uh, at some point or something like that just that idea of a, a really good tree gets kind of manifested within nature and you can appreciate the nature for what it is for like being a very tree-like tree essentially and then you could say that tree has a kami and so it becomes very special and has a kind of sentimental value to people and so you want to kind of preserve it and you want to stay in accord with nature and appreciate nature for its beauty 
But then again, it doesn't necessarily have to just extend to trees. You could have very rock-like rocks and oceans and, and rivers and, and streams and things like that. So it it's venerates nature quite a bit. And even people can manifest certain qualities that can kind of make them kami as well. So it's really weird for people to think like Thomas Edison is a, is a kami, the kami of light. What are you talking about? But it's, it's yeah. just like a, he manifests certain qualities which uh, allowed him to create like the light bulb and uh, advance people, I guess. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like strictly gods or, or spirits or things like that. Cool. Thank you. Just for people who don't know this stuff like super well, and this is still even like a little bit of a niche topic, but if you're familiar with the old Hayao Miyazaki movie, Spirited Away, that idea of Kegare will come up with like the baths that literally all of the kami will go to. Yeah. So if you think of something like the river spirit having all of this pollution in it, it literally transforms the kami of that river into something indistinguishable and rotten to the characters until they get rid of that pollution and see its true, beautiful nature. Hmm. Hmm. That's really interesting because I first watched Spirited Away without any context. And I didn't understand what was happening at all. Same, same here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But once you know a little bit about that stuff, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's the yeah. bastard's curse. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, God. <laughs> Hi, Sophie here. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young? Instead of the cross, the albatross around my neck was hung. In this excerpt from Rime of the Ancient Mariner, Samuel Taylor Coleridge explains what it was like to be me in early 2017. That's right, we're back to discussing a certain video again. However, Sin has asked me to make this note quote unquote positive. So I would just like to warmly thank the last protagonist, for making a series of in-depth and very intelligently done videos about using Japanese and Japanese concepts to explain the Souls games. Because now people are asking him instead of me. And he has the advantage of actually knowing what he's talking about. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Back to the podcast. My introduction to the concept of Kagari was actually Demon Souls. There was someone who posted about the Japanese script and they were like, oh yeah, Valley of Defilement's called Valley of Kagari. This is a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I just remember looking it up and thinking, oh, okay, that makes sense actually. The word stuck in my head, and then when it came to looking at Bloodborne, I'm like, oh, this keeps coming up in Bloodborne as well. And then that sort of like got me thinking about like maybe, you know, I, I, I was aware obviously that it was a Japanese series. Mm -hmm. And we should not be thinking of it in Western terms because that was a pitfall that a lot of people were encountering. Right. Was seeing like cathedrals and like Christian imagery and assuming therefore the game is Christian. And that and I was like, okay, no, this 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 notions of like Shinto pollution and defilement and sin and things, they're actually what's forming the spiritual sort of backbone of the story. I agree with you. Yeah, so like when Bloodborne came out and they're like talking about like, oh yeah, the the vile blood blood is like it's like Chino Kagare, and I'm like, oh, I see. <laughs> Bloodborne was was difficult for a lot of people to get their head around because aesthetically it's so Western. It's obviously set in, like, some European city that's a mixture of, like, Prague and London. Mm -hmm. It's got a church that looks like a Catholic church. It's got priests in it. It's got, like, repeated use of the Pieta. It's got all these, mm -hmm. like, they were, like, they're taking communion from a, from a, a goblet. You know, like, mm -hmm. there's reference, like, holy grails and things. And, like, so it, it appears on the surface as very, very Western. And even people who've done licensed Bloodborne stuff, like... The Bloodborne comic, from what I can tell, actually sort of just like accepts that and moves on with it. And it, it bases the healing church in that on on an actual church. Like it looks historically at how the Catholic Church operated. And it sort of bases its healing church on that. So um, 
Yeah, I feel like that was sort of when it clicked. Um, you sort of needed to understand that. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I think to just piggyback off of your point with uh, the whole Western veneer over what seemed to be like a very, very Eastern game at its roots, and it's hard to pierce that kind of shell and figure that out. Partially because, as you said, like the, the veneer of the church and everything, but I would also add to that the whole of crafting element also mm-hmm. throws people for a loop. As much as I love the game, I think people tend to fall into the thought that since it's love crafting, it doesn't need to be understood or that it cannot be understood. Whereas I feel like there is a lot of uh, things that you can pull apart and have like thought experiments with it and come yeah. to different conclusions. But there is more to it and it is meant to have like a very solid story and a framework for which, I, I don't know, you can make comparisons between the game and life and even other kind of schools of thought. Yeah, and, and also even the Lovecraftian stuff, like, Lovecraft's not writing stories that don't make sense. He's writing stories about things that don't make sense. That's the distinction. Mm-hmm. It's about characters encountering things that they can't explain. But that's not the same as, like, the story just means nothing and it's just random, which I think a lot of people were, were assuming when they hear about Lovecraft. That's a very good point. So earlier you mentioned the concept, last protagonist, stagnation. Yes. Do you want to talk a little about that? Yes. The first uh, time that I really heard about the concept of stagnation as applied to the FromSoft games were from uh, Sophie's old videos. It's this idea that if you have like a a standing pool of water, it doesn't necessarily have to be water, but the fluid metaphor is like the most uh, easily explainable. If you just have uh, a stagnant, a still pond of water or any body of water, eventually it will allow uh, the impurities within it, the kegare, so to speak, to settle down to the bottom and congeal into something. And as Sophie pointed out in her videos, like uh, standing water was like a breeding ground, uh, which that idea of a breeding ground uh, does come up quite a bit in different contexts in the Soulsborne games, like the bed of chaos. And, and from like the, that kind of a breeding ground of impurity, you get things like uh, mosquitoes and, and centipedes and all of those kind of nasty creatures that plague humanity. Yeah. Thank you. Now, there's also like different type of pollution, I guess. Yes. Which I found interesting. There's like specific blood pollution, death pollution, hmm. birth pollution. As far as I know, and there's still a lot of research that I need to do on it, that um, Kegare is mostly uh, death adjacent. So blood and like birth pollution, those are kind of related just because uh, when a woman gives birth, there's going to be a lot of blood that's produced in that process. And so with blood being uh, intrinsically tied to death as well as life, there is a little bit of a um, irony in that. Aside from that, there is also kinds of pollution that can be caused as a result of someone's actions. So like killing somebody, but ironically enough, like killing somebody isn't as kegare as coming into contact with an already dead, uh, rotting body. Part of that is because like the more that something is in a state of decay, the more impure and defiled it is. And if you think about it from like an anthropological standpoint, it kind of makes sense. Like if you come in across like a rotting carcass in the middle of a road, there's a much larger chance of that carcass having like diseases that can infect your town and kill your loved ones versus, you know, you killing somebody in a, in a pit of fashion. Yeah. Yeah. And and also like from a, from a, not necessarily from an anthropological point of view, but from just a psychological point of view, there's an obvious, I don't want to go into like, all people have these like innate beliefs about things. Cause that's a little like, I don't think so. But, like, you can see very easily how independently all these cultures develop this notion of, like, there's, like, things that are permeating the boundary between a person and the and the outside. So, like, blood, like, it's supposed to be in you, but now it's out. Like, feces, are, they're in you, now they're out. Yes, disorder, that's... Yeah, yeah. Like, disorder also plays into Kegare, so that's, that's a really good point to bring up. I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm like, I, again, I, I struggle to think of, of cultures that don't have like that sort of like unease around bodily fluids and things about the body that are breaking through the body's boundaries. 
I think I actually saw this as an example of Kegare when I was like doing my research. Like, shoes are obviously like more of an outside thing, so you don't want to put them on top of a table. I mean, partially because they have like dirt on them from the outside, but even if you just put something that's typically belongs in a different spot into a place where it doesn't belong, it kind of creates that sense of Kegare of disorder. Yeah, and that can yeah. be impactful yeah. for things as well. Yeah. Let me ask you, last protagonist, have you read Purity and Danger by Mary Douglas? I don't believe so. So basically she talks about Kegare and different ways how he can interpret it in terms of like hygiene or psychological stuff or chaos. And she was talking about something like that as well, where things that belong outside should stay outside and not inside. Things that belong on the second floor should not go like on the first floor and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sophie here. Despite Sin's entirely deserved reputation for loudly interrupting and rudely talking over people, she sometimes gets a little bit shy. Sin wanted to talk about the use of Kegare as a means of maintaining social order. The example she would have used is the veneration of the royal family as Kami, meaning the further from the royal family you were, the further from the divine you were, and thus the more Kegare you were. She would have related this back to the Souls games by talking about the Valley of Defilement and referring to it as double Kegare. Back to the podcast. I think one of the most interesting aspects of studying Soulsborne lore, which really separates it even just from like the act of trying to like research things related to Eastern philosophies and all that stuff, is I feel like Miyazaki's games take a real focus on that idea of stagnation, and they kind of make it more of their own thing because this idea of stagnation I think could probably be more broadly tied to the idea of like attachment to life and things like that and so by the time of Dark Souls 3 it, I, I think generally the game is trying to make a, a very clear message of you need to know when to let go and when to uh, allow death into the cycle so that way life can exist so yeah and, that, and that's sort of like toward the like the DLC which like we've complained about but like toward the end you are confronted with a swamp full of cicadas Yes, and it's like not only those cicadas, but the pilgrims are turning into these. They're clearly based on cicadas, the way that they're like cracking open, and these things are coming out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh yeah, like like new life is coming into it, and the cicada is like cicada song signifies like okay, the season is changing. So the end is very clear, like okay, now things need to die because we are changing. We're going into a new world, and it's done with these like bugs cracking open and things flying away. I do agree with that for a large part of it. I think one of the other things that I'd like to talk about in like the relation to stagnation is the way that it's presented in Dark Souls is that it's trying to hold on to what already exists and prevent that cycle from continuing, which is very different than just the idea of death being dirty. So I think that's like the FromSoft spin on things. Like it isn't necessarily death that's bad as much as it is stagnation and attachment. But um, even even with all of that said, like there is still a lot of bad things that get related to death. But I think in, in the broad scheme of things, like death is just like a, a state of potentiality for life in these games. And, and you know, the the notion of like the undead is that like they are they are neither. They are not living. They are not dead because they cannot pass on. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I think that like ties into Gwyn subverting the natural order of the universe, like what Koth talks about. Yeah, I don't yeah. always remember exactly what he says in English, but he uses a very specific word in Japanese, yeah. which is just utter hell to translate. It's it's ri. Um, it essentially means like logic, order, yeah. nature itself, and so that's that's a really loaded term that's hard to do justice. When we talk to Loki about dark souls like when he he's doing his like trying to be as close as possible he does refer a lot to like what he calls the logic of the world mm -hmm. yes like gwen gwen is altered the logic of the world the logic of the world has changed and that's sort of yes and to me that represents like an act of stagnation that he's yeah, subverting yeah. the idea that it's it's going to be a cycle where the fire exists and then naturally wanes and dies out but he 
artificially prolongs that age of fire. And to me, I think by the time you get to Dark Souls 3, it's very clear that that ends up becoming a negative thing. And I think yeah. that kind of uh, prolonged nature of stagnation and a, a kind of false cycle of rebirth might have some kind of uh, parallels to uh, Rosaria's Fingers Covenant, where if you keep on being reborn so many times, eventually you're going to turn into a man grub. So that's kind of how I feel like that covenant plays into the like the greater cosmology of Dark Souls. It's like the more you try to resist the natural cycle of uh, life and death, the more grotesque it'll become. And I feel like by the time of Dark Souls 3, you get the things like the deep, which didn't exist in the previous two games. Yeah. Hmm. Did you say reborn? I did. I was just sitting there thinking, like, you have a glint in your eye, because I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea. Chelsea. Hi, Sophie here. In my previous aside, I apologized for Sin being a little bit shy and not wanting to interrupt people. But that's not true when the subject is Kitekyo Hitman Reborn, an anime that Sin and I watched one season of but feels like it has infected my life for the last 50 fucking years. <laughs> if you're interested in Sin and I discussing Reborn for about five and a half hours, which was edited down from about 20, you can find it on this channel, where it's called The Policy. Now back to our podcast, which is not about Kotekyo Hitman Reborn, despite Sin's best efforts. Oh yeah, the, the line that you're, the, the English version of that is, um, Gwyn has perverted the course of nature. That's actually pretty good then, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes that's like one of my weaknesses. I don't exactly remember what was kind of in the Japanese versus the English. So sometimes I, I screw things up like that. I get confused about what's still in the game and what was removed. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Thank you, last protagonist. Thank you, Sophie. Last protagonist, let me ask you. What is Tsumi and how is it related to Kegare? So there is a lot of overlap between Tsumi and Kegare. Generally, now I would say like this idea of Sumi is a bit dis disambiguated to some of the older like Shinto-esque concepts or like Buddhist concepts in that uh, Sumi encompasses these ideas of sin, guilt, and crime or like wrongdoing, I guess. And so obviously wrongdoing and things related to pollution and, and all that stuff does have like a lot of overlaps with the ideas of Kegare. And having Sumi or Kegare will make somebody defiled, essentially. But it's it's a different kind of defiled from, like, ideas in the West where it kind of defines your character. This is more of a kind of more, like, physical idea where it doesn't completely stain somebody, I guess. Like, uh, that's kind of wording it a bit too strongly, perhaps. But there's always the potential, I, I suppose, where you can purify yourself or... yeah try to make yourself a better vessel for life, I suppose. That's something that struck me about the Rhea and Petrus quest in, in Dark Souls, well, at least when I first played it. Um, this was sort of my first introduction to, oh, this works in an interesting way, the way it's treating sin and morality, because the way in which you save Rhea is you have to kill Petrus. But Petrus will not attack you first. You actually have to murder him. And that is the only way to save Ray is to murder someone, but because it's a murder, according to the laws of the game, you have now sinned. Petrus is just straight up killing people, but because you hit him first, according to the rules of the game world, <laughs> you're actually the bad one by trying to stop him. So you then have to go and get purified at um, Oswald. I think that's a, a fundamental moral problem that we even like grapple with in the West. Like very often in these kind of a yeah types of uh, philosophical debates we say well would you steal to feed your family if that was like the only way you could provide for them i mean yeah. no matter what you do like stealing for your family one could argue is for the greater good yeah but that doesn't absolve you of that sin so to speak so i, I feel like there is that kind of overlap between the cultures to some extent but it's just it's a little bit hard to cross those boundaries at times yeah 
one thing about Kegare that's kind of interesting is that you can catch it from someone. Even now, like in the times of Corona, what what better time to explain it? Like the idea of contact tracing, it's essentially uh, a primeval form of it. I guess primeval is a bit too strong, but it's essentially like a, a pre-modern version of contact tracing. And so uh, the idea was if somebody is Kegare, they should not by any means bring that Kegare to a sacred site or a sacred person, whether that be um, a priest or the emperor himself. And so actually there are a lot of uh, historical records that blame like a lot of calamitous events on the result of somebody coming into contact with Kegare and bringing it to a holy site or to an emperor. And so certain things like um, floods, fires, earthquakes, etc., even imperial curses can be traced to this idea of bringing Kegare to uh, Kami and angering them and causing these kind of divine acts of retribution. That's also like, that's something we, not to the same extent, but we have similar things in the West as well. Like, I'm thinking of like the story of the Good Samaritan that we all sort of know, but it mentions all this, like these priests came by and didn't help him. But like, if you know historically that place and that culture, like if those priests had stopped to help him, they would not have been allowed back in the temple because they touched someone who was bleeding and dirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess it's like, it's it's something that we sort of, we moved to a more sort of like morality based way of looking at things rather than like about pollution and like substances and things. Yeah. As you said, it is a bit more morality based, I feel in the West, whereas like in yeah. the East, it's, it's much more physical. Like, yeah, despite it being like physical, like it, it can have like kind of metaphysical ramifications which is kind of interesting to consider but overall like kegare is is treated as a physical thing it doesn't define somebody that's like really relevant to bloodborne because like the whole sort of thrust of that is that you are cursed because of what the hunters did in the past even though you're not one of them because you have within you the blood of yarnum so, like, even though you're not from Yarnum and you have no connection to any of these people, the second you got that transfusion, that cursed blood went into you and now it's all on you. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with what, what you want as a person. It has nothing to do with, like, you can't do anything about it. And then you have Simon and he's, like, just whining, like, this isn't fair. Like, I didn't do this. This is not, like, my forefathers did this. It wasn't me. Why, why do I have to suffer? So... Going back off what you said, this I, I think generally, even in all of the games, there's this idea of inheritance, which is extremely important to all of them, but it gets a little bit muffled a bit just because it's it's a little bit awkward to just say it so bluntly. So that the idea of linking the flame is isn't necessarily linking them. Like I was confused my first time playing like Dark Souls. I'm like, okay, so I need to make a pilgrimage like the Olympic torch, I guess, and like light all of them as opposed to Literally, you're you're inheriting the flame, the first yeah. flame. Yeah. So that idea is also used in Bloodborne. So like you get the air rune from Henrik, and it mm -hmm. says like those who will bear like the echoing will before him. As you guys are pretty familiar with, the idea of the will comes from uh, Chino Ishi or like the dying wills of blood. So yeah. you're literally inheriting the wills and desires of the dead, which is uh, pretty bizarre. Uh, unless you're like kind of familiar with all of this terminology and what the games are really trying to talk about. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the other like main example of that would be the, the note in the grand cathedral before going in touching Lawrence's skull, it says heir to the purveyor of ministration. So they've inherited blood ministration from Lawrence and that kind of ties into everything as well. Yeah. Thank you. Now, we talked about purification a little bit. So you could get rid of Kigari through a purification ritual type deal. Yes. I'm not entirely like super familiar with it because I don't live in Japan and I'm a, not like a, a national. So I only really know about this stuff from like secondhand sources. But the idea of being able to purify Kigare and impurity can come from different sources, as uh, Sin was just saying. So one of them is through uh, water, which is kind of important to that idea of like flow and stagnation. Yeah. Uh, another one would be performing like ritual actions. So I, I think a very popular anime nowadays is um, Demon Slayer. So right. they have their um, kagura, their dances, their ritual dances, 
uh, will allow people to kind of purify impurities within them. Then there are certain things like uh, festivals, Matsuri, which will uh, allow the Kami to kind of like visit and bestow its blessing on the people. And so there are multiple ways to get rid of Kegare. And one of the things that really kind of baffles me about like the Soulsborne games is there's really very little emphasis placed on purification overall. I think like there's only the one spell in like Dark Souls 3. And other than that, everything else relates to like bloodletting. Within the context of Dark Souls, you've got like the what's it called? The purif- purifying flame. And you literally stick your hand into somebody almost like a visceral attack and just burn the dirt out of them. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's um that's what the the hollows in the Cathedral of the Deep seem to be doing to themselves is like a purification thing. Because that's where all the yes. rebirth happens. That's like Cathedral of the Deep is like the main like, OK, should be Kigare place. And like that's where like you have the the hollows and they're all they're ritually stabbing themselves and, and immolating themselves presumably to get all that out of them, and there's that huge emphasis on bloodletting the idea being like oh, there's all this stuff in you we have to get it out mm-hmm. yeah and like that's the place where we're talking about like purifying yourself and like flowing water you can see that like that area that's just basically full of like like I guess it's literally just piles of shit and dead bodies. Um, mm-hmm. That used to clearly be like water because it has these giant taps, I guess, or fountains on the walls that currently, if you go under them, they spew this toxic shit all over you. But presumably beforehand, that was that was spewing like pure water, maybe from the deep before the deep was corrupted. So like that would presumably have been like a purification thing. If you went there, you would get like it all washed away in this cathedral and then over time they've just sort of flipped and embraced it and be like okay i guess this is like just corrupt now yeah that reminds me because like in dark souls one before you uh essentially wake up framped there's water in the little temple right next to Firelink. and i think in the interviews miyazaki said they first wanted to put the bonfire in like the midst of a lake but they just couldn't make it work for a variety of reasons right yeah yeah like, w- water is a huge thing in Kingsfield as well, and also in Sekiro. And, and uh, going back to that idea of, like, Misogi, it's like before you visit a Shinto shrine, one of the things visitors need to do is purify themselves by, like, taking the kind of uh, water that's already at the temple, cleansing their hands with it, so that way they're clean before they go see the kami. And uh, another, like, very popular example of that is, like, the very uh, famous images of like monks meditating under waterfalls to kind of not only purify their bodies, but also their minds and souls. But uh, generally, I I think going back to that idea of like purifying, like we really don't get many examples of like successes of that within like Bloodborne and and Dark Souls. So uh, there's like the blood letter that's pretty similar to the idea of like bloodletting, obviously look at the name alone, but there's, there's no way for them to kind of escape the curse of everything so to me that's why I, I think the idea of like the hunter being a kind of a shinigami or like a grim reaper to kind of set free like a lot of the trapped spirits that have been imbibed by everybody else that appeals to me to kind of like reconcile like how do they get rid of all of this impurity yeah and there's actually like I, I guess going back to like stuff that was that was removed from the game but it's like interesting it looks like there was going to be a way to purify Annalise at some point there's this old version of Annalise where she keeps bringing up that like her blood is corrupted and her blood is and that's why she can't die Mm -hmm. but like her blood has like she's been given this cursed blood that makes her immortal and um it looks like I don't have like hard data for this it's just a bunch of like stuff floating around but it looks like you would actually have been able to purify her blood at some point and that's what she would have been allowed to die and that's like the one sort of good ending but I, I think even you saying that goes back into that idea of stagnation, where if you take that idea more broadly of being unable to die, I would almost say like is the equivalent of stagnation in these games, which goes back to like Sekiro as well and the centipedes that keep people alive. Name for the the hollows is uh, interesting. Is it's Moja in Japanese? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about Moja? Uh, I know a little bit about it. So it's more specifically a buddhist term and while it can mean dead it also means somebody who is taken over by a covetous greed so i think the idea of of like comparing like the the hollows to things like zombies works as a pretty good like cross-cultural reference but at least in japan it might have more deep-seated cultural connotations that even i'm not 
too familiar with? The way I understood it is that it's specifically it's a word that's used to talk about people who are like they've reincarnated in a way that like they're stuck in a cycle of reincarnation. And it's like you're you're sort of tied to things like the way the hollows repeat the same thing over and over again. It's like you, you're a moja because you can't pass on because you're tied to this one thing. And that's why, like, the, the hollows all sort of, like, they, they die once they complete their task, like Sigmaya. So that idea of attachment is, like, really important. And so Moja, with that idea of, like, them being related to greed, I think mm-hmm. ties into that idea as well. Like, they can't pass on because they're fixated on, like, material wealth or whatever. So they can't escape the cycle of uh, rebirth or moving on to their next stage in karma. Yeah, and you get that also with, like, The Hunter's Nightmare, where, like, the characters, this they seem to have taken on forms that sort of, like, reflect... It's like a reincarnation thing. You know, the hungry ghost? Like, you get reincarnated as, like, this thing with a huge bloated stomach that can't stop eating. <laughs> and, like, the, the design of that is, like, that's clearly what the blood lickers in Kanehurst are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. The, the gaki, the idea of, like, if you were a bad person in life and you were greedy and you were, like, gluttonous... When you die and you go to the afterlife, you become something that is always eating Mm -hmm. and it can never be full. And like going back to Kigari, there's no other food. So you have to eat blood and you have to eat excrement. And that's clearly what the blood lickers are invoking in their design. And if you look at them, they have human faces. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's sort of saying like, okay, this is not just like some weird monster. This is like, oh, if you're too greedy for blood, if you're too like... If you indulge in this, if it becomes your life, you actually, like, you will become something else. Yes, and all of the hunters in the Hunter's Nightmare will just say, more blood and all that kind of thing. So it just shows their single-minded devotion to getting more blood, despite them literally being damned for eternity in search of it. Yeah, we, we talked about this a little bit, but, like, Ludwig. Like, the Ludwig boss doesn't look like anything else in the game. So you get this sense that, like, okay, Ludwig... That's probably like he was a beast, but the the fact he just looks insanely strange is probably like that's an effect of like this nightmare is shaping the things in it and it's coming to reflect the deeds of the person who did it. So the beast form of Ludwig comes to like Lawrence as well. The beast, the form in the nightmare comes to resemble something else. The way that I interpret the nightmares would be that they're kind of shaped by their inhabitants. So part of my rationale for that is you have two plus instances of uh, Cathedral Ward all hobbled together in uh, The Hunter's Nightmare. You have a pseudo-Central Yarnum with uh, like a, a potentially Gilbert <laughs> in uh, the uh, full-on beast guy who has the Oto Workshop badge, the, the Firing Hammer badge, and uh, a lot of things just kind of seem to manifest as a result of the psyches of the people around them. So you could even say like The Hunter's Dream with Garmin kind of fits that logic. That's the thing about the the Hunter's Nightmare that I find really interesting. Because, like, Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2... Well, okay, Dark Souls 1 does it straight up with time travel. Like, you go back to the past. Dark Souls Mm -hmm. 2 is getting it, and it's like, okay, these are memories. But the memories that we're given, there's really no... We're not given the indication that the memories aren't anything other than basically time travel. Like, this is is presented as, like, this is a memory, so it's actually, like, an objective recording of something that Mm -hmm. happened. Then Bloodborne does it. This is is a memory, but it is a completely subjective experience that is psychological. So the Yarnum that you find in The Hunter's Nightmare, it's not a snapshot of Yarnum. It's Yarnum characterized as this place where like there are rivers of blood flowing through it the buildings are collapsing there is fire everywhere because Mm -hmm. that's how people experienced it Mm -hmm. that's people's memories are traumatic so it creates this traumatic landscape or it could also be a representation of their warped state of mind as they've become completely consumed with their search for the blood and everything yeah yeah Mm. and like he's like the hunter's dream is the opposite it's like this is the most idyllic place imaginable Mm -hmm. yeah Thank you. So now, let's talk a bit more about Kegari in From Software Games. And let's start with Kegari and Bloodborne. So Chino Kegari is uh, 
blood dregs, obviously. So I, I don't exactly know where they got the idea of dregs from. Maybe just because like Higare means like impurity and things like that. I would make the argument almost that like the league rune, which I think is called impurity, and the Kanehurst rune. What's the Kanehurst rune's English name? Corruption. Corruption. Okay. I would almost argue that those are uh, both mistranslated. I mean, I guess the Kanehurst one does a pretty good job of like getting that idea. The league one is Yodomi, which is uh, stagnation. Or you could even argue like dregs. So like the league rune could be dregs. So the term um, Yodomi comes up throughout the games in different contexts. So uh, the term human dregs in Dark Souls 3 is uh, Hito no Yodomi. So like man's dregs or man's stagnation. So just that same idea is present in both games. So um, with the, the league rune essentially being stagnation, I would say that the Kanehurst rune Kegare should have been understood as impurity. And uh, I realize that doesn't answer the, the question directly, for which I apologize. <laughs> but um, the Chino Kegare represents the impurities that are inherent within the blood. And one of the most interesting aspects about that is the game explicitly correlates the impurities within blood to being found within, within the blood of hunters, like the most consistently, uh, the, the blood of echo fiends. So we can directly tie a very, very strong correlation between the blood echoes and the impurities within blood. Yeah. The echo fiends are people who are addicted to uh, the blood or the ones who gather it the most. And since hunters are kind of given that divine mission, for lack of a better term, they are targeted by the blood hunters of Kanehurst, as they're called. And so that might have introduced a bit of conflict between Kanehurst and the Healing Church, which could have resulted in the tragedy, the raid on Kanehurst. But um, generally speaking, when enough Kegare or impurity is produced in the blood, it alters the, the physiology of the beings. And the, the culture of Kanehurst took these impurities and funneled them up to their queen who would then disseminate it back down to their to her servants in a, in a form of, I like to say, uh, trickle-down economics. <laughs> so, a, a literal form of it. So with uh, them making their queen more uh, impure, they are essentially, in my view, making her more uh, superhuman, bringing her closer to the Great Ones. And so because she's closer to the Great Ones, that's where I get the idea that she's superhuman from. And since... Uh, Queen Annalise is called the Queen of Blood in some of the, the vile blood items. I think the, the Kane Hurst yeah. vile blood register still says it explicitly. And, the Undying Queen of Blood, yeah. And uh, Queen Yarnum is also called a Queen of Blood. It leads me to believe that the whole idea of Kane Hurst civilization is probably the remnants of what we saw in Tumaru. The other thing is that the um, the shadows of Yarnum, the who are Yarnum's agents, like they drop the Blood rapture. Blood rapture, yeah, and it says like this is the this is the rune carried by the servants of the queen. And then the bloody crow of Kanehurst mm -hmm. also drops blood rapture. So it's like, okay, yes. there's this line of queens that like sort of starts at Yarnum and ends at Annalise and well it ends at Ariana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when we look more directly at this idea of Kegare, uh while we, we think of it as like impurity and being bad and evil, it's essentially also what makes things divine in the Bloodborne universe. So this ties back into the idea of that kind of contradiction in terms that I was talking about much earlier. The idea that through impurity, you gain closer access to the divine. So that's that's a really interesting dichotomy to consider. Like there's the whole idea that um, enlightenment is indistinguishable from madness. And yeah. so the, the idea of like contradictions at times is something that they play up to build the mystique of the games. And like, um, I, I know like with, this is Bloodborne, but like Aldrich is that as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Aldrich is like, he's like completely embraces the notion of the filth. You offer filth to the Aldrich faithful to level up that, like you're literally just giving them like filth. Yes. And, and going back to that idea with the divine, reconsider that the idea that the Chino Kegare, the blood dregs are linked to blood echoes specifically. The, the literal cosmic power unit within Bloodborne, which makes us essentially like godlike figures, that is where I, I think there's a lot of things to consider because Kegare in Japanese culture strictly is related to death and 
all of that stuff, but blood is, you know, very strongly linked to death. And with the blood echoes having the wills and spirits of the dead within it, I think that's where you could argue, like, the divine power of the blood comes from. Yeah. Like, literally the spirits of the people within it. Thank you. And I think it's really interesting what you mentioned, how the more Kigare Annalise's blood is, the more, like, great ones she is. Yes, and uh, thank you for bringing that back up, because I, I forgot to tie it to Ariana, who we've been uh, talking about throughout this. Um, when we look at her umbilical cord, it says that uh, it was corrupted blood, uh, Kegare blood, which drew Odin, Erdin to, uh, Odin <laughs> to its uh, eldritch liaison with her. So having more impure, corrupted blood is uh, very explicitly more closely tied to the Great Ones. Alfred mentions something very interesting about the blood. Yes, Sin. Could you please elaborate on my thought? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Alfred's description of it is that he says that, like, a forbidden blood was brought to Canehurst and there the inhuman vile bloods were born. Yes. Yes. Sin, where was I supposed to go with this? <laughs> what are my overall thoughts about that? Yeah. So, um, I think Alfred is a bit of an unreliable character, not due to any, like, character flaws of his own. I'd, I'd say, I'd say Alfred has a number of character flaws. Uh, uh, but continue. <laughs> his biggest character flaws, you know, being voiced by Solaire, so everyone immediately trusts him, but... He, he's probably naive to the point where he's just been taken in by, uh, healing church propaganda, and so... Yeah. He, he believes he's telling us the truth. Like, it's very clear that he's a, a devout follower of the religion. I don't believe he is intending to deceive the player, except for, the, you know, the chance to fulfill his holy mission, which is, it's whatever. It's more like a lie by a mission. But um, overall, his his idea that the blood was forbidden by the healing church does have some sub sustenance or substance rather because uh yeah. that is kind of repeated in Adela's blood vial that if uh, a member of the old healing church were to see it or no maybe it's Ariana's blood it's vial it's Ariana yeah it'd be uh would they notice that it's forbidden yeah so the blood was forbidden but as to its origins um this will kind of like tie back into some of the co content it doesn't really matter exactly where they got it because there is some doubt cast on alfred's uh words just on the writer yeah. plot description itself yeah that the nobles of canehurst are uh long time imbibers of the blood and not strangers to the sanguine plague or something like that yeah yeah so there's a very strong chance that the people of Canehurst could have had the blood before the healing church even. And going back to that idea with the cut content, there is, there are cut lines by Willem that explicitly points out that Garman was the one who betrayed him before Lawrence. So if you wanted to say that there was a scholar who betrayed Willem, it's most likely Garman, but... Do you think Garman is a scholar? I, I don't... I don't really think it matters too much. He does call Willem Master Willem at least, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way that I like to envision Garmin is probably like the prototypical tomb prospector. He was probably the like their hired muscle to get into the tombs, who taught people how to handle monsters with grace and skill. <laughs> when you talk to him, he's completely deferential to Lawrence and Willem, which suggests like, but he's also much older, so it suggests he's like he's like a retainer. He's not actually a scholar. Going back to like Alfred's thing, I think honestly, like Alfred, it's like you said, it's a lie by omission. Just from squinting at this for six years. <laughs> I think the story, as far as I can make out, is that Lawrence is the scholar. Lawrence brought the blood to Canehurst because he wanted Annalise to conceive a child. And then when Annalise conceived, that's when they attacked, they stole the child, they took it back to, to Yana. That's, as far as I can make out, that seems to be the only way you can really line everything up. I have, like, conflicting thoughts about it. Like, I don't have, like, ones that are super set in stone. Like, one of the things that makes sense to me is you could potentially make that argument that the raid on Canehurst was to, like, take their child of blood, and that could have, at one point, have been Murgo. It could have been Annalise's child. But they probably played around with things in development, and... Absolutely. There's also the possibility that she did conceive because she doesn't want the player to, mm -hmm. like, marry her. And that has, like, a lot of ties with, like, the, the Ring of Betrothal and, and Tumaru and all that. But by the same token, why is she still accepting blood dregs? It's it's a bit strange. 
that's why like I brought up the, the removed stuff before because the removed stuff is a lot more straightforward it's like she's corrupted she wants to die bring her stuff so she can die and this is like she's corrupted she hates herself but at the same time she's like trying to have an heir which is like what and it's very evident in like 1.00 that they did not have a very uh, no, strong idea no. of the blood drags. Um, yeah. And that's without characters falling through the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so now, let me ask you about vermin. Vermin is a really interesting concept. There's a lot of questions as to whether or not they truly exist or whether or not they're a product of madness or the nightmares or things like that. The idea seems to be manifest in multiple ways throughout the games. So whether or not the, the vermin specifically tied to the rune are are a specific thing, or if it, they're just like a representation of a, an overall idea is something that's kind of hard to talk about at times, just because it's not super clear. So with them potentially being the, the root of, what is it, man's impurity in the English? The, the Japanese is uses the same term as like the human dregs. It's a uh, hito no yodomi no kongen. So like the source of all man stagnation. So, uh, or dregs, I guess would be another way of saying it. Not not like the blood dreg style. But that idea of um, the vermin potentially being related to stagnation and things like human dregs is interesting. It might settle people down into a state where like the impurities can collect at the bottom and cause more grotesque transformations into beasthood. And uh, in the other games like Sekiro, you have like the centipedes that'll come out of the... The infested. The infested, thank you. I was thinking of like the uh, ascetic monks yeah. in Senpo Temple. Mm -hmm. In Dark Souls, you've got like pretty much you could equate it to like the pilgrims even with all of the insects coming out of them or the maggots yeah. in the Cathedral of the Deep. And in Bloodborne, it can even potentially show up again with like the bloodletting yeah. beast or... With the parasites in the, the lore and silver beast, I guess. This is the thing, like, I'm fairly sure those are supposed to be, like, the same thing as vermin, just, like, a different different looking one. Because when you think about it, it's like, the bloodletting beast, okay, that's, like, the most corrupt thing. So it makes sense that things got, maybe, in, like, I guess the, ver the centipede vermin that you see, it's just, like, a different kind. As far as I can tell, um, it just calls the vermin mushy, doesn't it? It doesn't... Yes, it's like bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's just bug. So, like, there can be different kinds of bug. Yes. Yeah, like, I was looking at, um... God, I've forgotten the name of it, but there was this old Japanese, like, book of, like, diseases. And there's this whole thing in there about, like, yeah, this disease is caused by this invisible bug that lives in you, and they all have little designs. Oh, have you ever seen, um... Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. Mushishi? No, but I've heard of it. Okay, so th it might be related to that, and uh, yeah, yeah. sorry to cut you off. <laughs> oh no, it's like they're all called like something mushy, and it's like this okay. causes this disease. So I was like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, Bloodborne, like you got to literally like this corruption is breeding these vermin, and the vermin inside you are causing this like they're what's causing the disease. Because uh, I didn't even think about it in that way, but that's that's a good point. Can I can I give you my big vermin parallel? Absolutely. Okay, so the way that they nest in the in the um, the throats of the silver beasts, right? Mm -hmm. That is like people might not know this, but like if you look at a silver beast, the ones that have the, the parasites that shoot out of their mouth. If mm -hmm. the parasite's not shooting out of the mouth, you can actually see it in the mouth, like if you yes. move the camera around. And they're sitting in a way that is exactly the same as a species of parasite isopod that lives in the mouths of fish. It is this isopod, like an isopod is like like a little like underwater beetle crustacean. They sit inside the mouth, they eat the fish's tongue, and they sit in the mouth, and then when the fish eats, the isopod just sits there and it just eats whatever, like, the, there's all this, like, food in the fish's mouth, so the isopod's just like, om, 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 and it just eats it. <laughs> so, my take on the whole vermin thing is, I'm like, oh, they live in the throat, don't they? Because the bloodletting beasts one also lives in its throat. So, if you look at, like, what do vermin do? Well, they make you hungry for blood, and all these beasts are all biting you, and I'm like, are they getting at the notion that vermin live in you the vermin are like a parasite that lives off blood so they're actually their lust for blood is actually kind of what's getting to you and you start craving blood because this is a vermin in you that's also craving blood and it's trying to get more blood and is that why beasts are always like biting you and then getting a buff for biting you because there's like they're literally living in their throat like constantly eating like the runoff of the blood Maybe, but there is also that um, idea with like the beasthood transformation that the more 
you attack, the more buffed you get. So that could apply yeah. to just, just beasts in general. It's a lust for blood. It's a lust for like fighting and like. Well, I mean, it goes back again to like Demon Souls, which this Bloodborne is kind of like a pseudo sequel to in a lot of ways. But like the way that like that talks about like the soul in Demon Souls is like the seat of reason. It's sort of different to Dark Souls, where like soul is sort of what's binding the world together. Whereas in Demon Souls, it's like the soul is is reason, and that's why when people become soul starved in Demon Souls, they revert to that like just aggressive state, because it's like they've lost what makes them human. And but what makes them human is presented as like it's a state of mind. It's like your reason is what makes you human. It's not your body that makes you human. It's your reason, and that's mm-hmm. the sort of thing in in Bloodborne where like there's enemies in there that qualify as a beast, like the screaming Sadako people in the labyrinth. They qualify as a beast. They don't look like one. Mm -hmm. because the idea is like they're a beast because their reason is gone so they're acting like an animal and like the Ludwig fight like he's a beast in phase one he's not a beast in phase two because the idea is like in between the two phases his reason comes back he becomes Ludwig his mind reasserts itself he's no longer a beast even though it's the same body so that's kind of what interests me about like the beast it does seem to present beasthood as something that is like it's actually like it's to do with your your nature like your reason how your reason is functioning your body comes to resemble your reason. That's why you devolve into like a sort of pre-human form. I do understand where you're coming from with that, but the big monkey wrench in all topics related to beasthood is my one of my favorite NPCs in all of the games, the suspicious beggar. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> so he's he's really the true enigma yeah, in the entire game. Mess. Yeah. <laughs> I actually really like him, so Yeah, yeah. With that idea of like beasthood eroding the mind, I think that's true to an extent. And one of the things that I, I've kind of found somewhat recently is related to this idea of Taoism and this like Chinese uh, idea of Hun and Po. I'm probably like mangling the intonations of it because I can't read Chinese. It's it's kind of like the idea of yin and yang, and so. Within it, there's like this idea of, of a light soul and a dark soul. And I forget which one correlates to which. I think it's like the light soul relates to um, animal nature and the moon. So the dark soul is more related to uh, human nature, which kind of manifests like six months after you're born or, or whatnot. And uh, that's where you get like your, your reasoning and your rationale. So one aspect that could get related to that is... Um, the idea of willpower having a large influence over whether or not somebody is human or a beast. And with all of that being said, I think if the idea of uh, blood echoes essentially be- being like the, the, the leftover wills of the dead within them and people hungering for blood, it makes me wonder if imbibing too much of it causes somebody's own innate will to become diluted. So... When we look at items like the blue elixirs, that dilutes the person's like literal presence within the, the Bloodborne universe. But it's the power of the blood echoes which allows the hunters to withstand it. So for whatever reason, like the hunter can like metabolize um, blood echoes. So I do wonder if that idea relates to beasthood, that like once you let go of your humanity, it allows like the beast within you to like take over you like you lose your rationale to some extent so that still doesn't really answer like the whole suspicious beggar conundrum but it's something at least i don't know one thing they keep harping on about in the in the items is like beasthood is not an infection beasthood is something that's within you and the blood is just drawing yes. it out yeah so let me ask you you keep saying that the suspicious beggar is weird do you, I don't know, Sin. I think he seems he seems like a stand-up guy. I think it's very important that we put him outside Urton Chapel because there's a monster that keeps killing NPCs in there. And he could probably stop it. Thank you, Sophie. But when you said he was like an enigma or whatever, what did you mean? So the suspicious beggar, other than Ludwig, is the only beast that seems to retain some form of intelligence and ability to speak yeah. as we encounter them. So if, if the suspicious beggar wasn't in the game, we could at least say, like, well, Ludwig has his magic sword that can kind of hand wave away all of the issues of, like, <laughs> why he's intelligent in his second phase. Well, also, but- Ludwig has two heads. I think that's important. Like, when you fight him in the first phase, it's like the the 
for lack of a better term, like the bug head, like the one that's just a bunch of teeth. That's the one that's mm-hmm. in charge. And then when you... The phase transition is actually you kill that head and then the other head wakes up. So it's like... They're sort of... It's like a composite being rather than like a beast that has a human mind. It's actually like it's sort of two different minds struggling in the same that's body. That's an interesting way of thinking yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. The suspicious beggar does not fit into that dichotomy whatsoever. No. So with, with the whole idea of like vermin causing beasthood or beasthood being the loss of one's rationality, that really all gets thrown out the window just because of this one bastard who kills everybody and kills the lore in the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the other example would, I guess, it's not really rationality, but Gascoigne as a beast will respond to the, the music box. Yes, um, for only, a little bit. Only a little, yeah, you can see, like, he has this dim memory of, like, something. Or, like, Amelia as a beast will still cling to the pendant and stuff. So there's, like, and she can pray. Yeah, and yeah. So there's, like, You some... can even argue, like, the cleric beast can pray and that's how it regenerates its limbs. But yeah. And, that's like, not exclusive yeah. to just, like, the, the former humans. Like, Amygdala mm. can regenerate its limbs and all of that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, like, the lore and clerics in the labyrinth, like, they still have the robes and the staffs and everything. So you can see that, like, oh, yeah. there's some kind of, like, they're clinging on to something. And, like, if you buy that the bloodletting beast is Lawrence and he was looking for Queen Yarnum, then, like, the headless body is just before Queen Yarnum. So it's, like, he seems to have remembered where he was going if that's supposed to be Lawrence. And you can see, like, eh. But again, speaking of Lawrence, I make this huge point about, oh, okay, Lawrence, like, what does he want most in the world is his memory back, because he's lost it as a beast. So what actually triggers the fight is you show up with the skull, and he's like, I, I recognize this as, like, my humanity, I need it back. Mm-hmm. And I think the Japanese makes it a bit clear that that's what it was supposed to represent. Yeah. I think, like, the English was, was a little bit scuffed, actually. Yeah. I don't think I even mentioned that in my videos, just because I tend to forget what's important, or, like, what is, is different between them, but I should have definitely included that and I forgot to do it. So it's like the symbol represents what he lost or like failed to protect. Yeah. Maybe that's in the English. I, sh- I should really look at it. It's what it's a, it, it, it says what this. he failed to protect, but it, it also says like, it's his human memory. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the Japanese is like, it's, it's both his oath and it represents what he failed to protect, which is like, yeah, his, his humanity, because he thought just like fearing the blood would, would be enough to sustain him. Yeah. But it's very abundant that, Fear is not what separates the humans from the beasts. And so the game does a really good job of just showing the the limits of the character's knowledge of their own universe. Yeah. So tying that all back to the suspicious beggar is difficult because if he wasn't in the game, it'd be very simple to say, well, beasthood means you're no longer man. You've lost your rationality as a man. But he flips it on its head. But... Arguably not, because bringing back up the examples of things like the Lauren clerics or even the beast possessed souls can bring some questions into that. Even the Lauren uh, silver beasts, because they use tools, which is yeah. definitely not a sign of a wild animal. And the the beasts in Old Yarnum, like they pray, like Amelia does. Yes. Like they they have like a full on congregation that's yeah. being led by a, a larger beast, and then they mm-hmm. all like run there. You can hear if you. A lot of people miss this because they just kill them all. But like, if you if you don't aggro them and you just wait outside, that you can hear them singing this like beast hymn. It's like oh, oh, oh. Mm-hmm. yeah. So like they, there's something in them that like. So as long as you don't have like one of the female beast patients uh, scream at you yeah. and like alert everybody else, they'll continue to chant. And so yeah. one of the easier ways to see that is like if you go to the top of that chapel before you like break open the vase that will set the, the entire church on fire, you get a really good chance to uh, listen to their kinds of arias there. Yeah. So there is a kind of like rationality to the beast that isn't very apparent on, on a first look. And even in some of my videos and probably some of Sophie's as well, like when you go out to central Yarnum for the first time, the people have already transformed. Actually, yeah. it's really easy to miss though. Like they've got the really long elongated left arms. Yeah. Uh, the brick trolls have tails and um, the guys that I, I just call beast boys, the, the ones that are yeah. like obviously beasts, but not scourge beasts. Yeah. The ones yeah. that like hold the, the fishing equipment yeah. or spears or whatever. Like they're very clearly beasts, but much more um, lucid. Yeah. Than and, other and, ones. and Dura sort of Dura touches on this, but not super explicitly. That's like, okay. He says like the beasts in old Yarnum don't mean any harm. Okay, wrong, because they will kill you if you go in there. But 
like in a sense he's correct because if you just leave all the arnhem alone it won't do anything mm -hmm. so in a sense like the beasts are in a lot of ways they're less dangerous than people because they don't have the ingenuity and the drive to do things like summon the red moon so i'm actually a little bit surprised to bring this up but this is something I, I've mentioned maybe only a very few times in just like some random uh, Discord servers. It's like a lot of uh, Bloodborne is, is kind of similar to the idea of like I Am Legend, where it's kind of like a post-apocalyptic world where the hunter is kind of the boogeyman for all of these other creatures. And because we don't understand them, we kind of killed them based on our prejudice and yeah. our lack of knowledge about them. Um, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> the movie's only... 17 years old? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, the suspicious beggar, when we meet him as a beast, he just transformed, right? Not entirely. He um, transforms when you attack him. Yes, and yeah. he'll also call out the player for being the real beast, the yeah. one having blood on our hands, yeah. which is kind of true and poignant in, in many ways, as we just kind of made that last reference to the movie um, I Am Legend, where it's like, the hunter has the blood on their hands of just killing with prejudice because they don't know any better. Yeah. Counterpoint, the um, suspicious beggar kills a family the first time you meet him, and then he kills everyone in Erden Chapel. Are you sure? Maybe you just found them there. Well, that's possible, yeah. Haven't you ever seen a dead child on the side of the road and wondered? <laughs> I love that. Much I love that you meet the guy and he's hunched over this, like, corpse. He's going, blah, 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 and he's, oh, I didn't see you there. And it's like, well, He's totally what? not red-handed <laughs> at all. Just like... What an interesting moral dilemma. Should I trust this person? I really wish in the, the files that they had, like, the stage directions on there. Like, I want to know if it says, like, the suspicious beggar barks in surprise. Like, <laughs> the way that he reacts yeah. is just too perfect. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but I wonder if you met the suspicious beggar, like, a month after he transformed, if he would be as lucid as he is. We mentioned, like, Gascoigne... Gascoigne recognizes the music box the first, I think, three times, and then he stops. He recognizes the music box as a human the yeah. first three times. Yeah. When he transforms, he only recognizes it once. Right, yeah. And yeah. that's the limit. Yeah, so, like, there's some residual, like, memory. But just to compare, like, the suspicious beggar to Gascoigne, well, Gascoigne does have that one specific trigger. Uh, Vicar Amelia doesn't have anything you can work with. The Cleric Beast doesn't have anything you can work with. Ludwig has the sword. Yeah, there's there's Ludwig with the sword. Yeah. So the the beggar is uh, pretty special in the way that he kind of transforms. Because Sin does bring up a good question. Like, if he's been transformed for a while, would he still have that kind of a sapience? Because the important beasts yeah. that you encounter down in the chalice dungeons don't try to talk it out before they yeah, yeah. mash you into to pull. I mean, it's possible that just like... The more he 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 ate as a beast, the more blood. He would probably just, like, his mind would break further, maybe. Actually, this is probably a good tie-in between, like, the suspicious beggar and the League. It could be because they're so consumed with their, their mission that they kind of retain their ability to stave off, like, full beasthood. And one of the most interesting things to me is... Falter is, is almost a mirror of Gascoin, but for whatever reason, he doesn't ever transform... He, he's focused on a mission, but it's not bloodlust to the same degree that Gascoigne is. So maybe there's a, a certain aspect of like bloodlust or, or following something or flowing that can kind of keep one uh, sane in the midst of madness. That comes up in Dark Souls with Holloway. Yes. Because like a, a good example is like the, the Crestfallen Merchant. When you meet him, he is hollowing and he's counting. If you keep talking to him, he sits there and he start, he's counting, like, numbers to try and, like, stay focused. He's like, mm -hmm. one, two, three, like that. And he starts he starts stumbling at one point and, like, freaking out and panicking because he can't remember the next number. I vaguely place. remember yeah. that, and I just played it, like, three yeah, days yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, that's like, yeah. So, um, one of the other surprising examples I think that I would compare it to would be the Mound Makers of, of everything between right. the League. Because there is this kind of notion that the vermin might only really exist in the minds of the league confederates and there's also the idea that the the symbol of the shackles of the gods might only exist within the minds of the mound makers yeah so yeah. whether or not it is actually something that's just purely yeah. 
within the eye of the beholder or if there is something more physical to it is a bit questionable and one yeah. of the examples would be like when you you don't actually have to have the covenant rune on you in bloodborne to get two or three vermin in, in the hunter's nightmare but yeah you are in the hunter's nightmare so that throws things yeah. into question as well i i think like the vermin sort of I'm fine with them existing because they're a counterpoint to phantasms. Yes. Which also exists. So it's like, okay, like, Enlightenment, Great Ones get the phantasms, Beasthood, Debasement gets the vermin. And, like, the way that, 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 that the, the two eyes are counterpointed, it's like, okay, this eye that's connected to vermin has rotted, and this eye that's connected to phantasm, it's completely, like, it's still fresh, even though mm -hmm. it's been removed from a corpse a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, like, I think it does make sense. Like, I think they, they probably are, like, they're as real as anything in that game is. You just need to see them. So let me ask you, how does vermin affect the blood, and what is the relationship between vermin and Kigare? So that's a good question. I don't think there's a really nice answer for I think the most that we could possibly give is just kind of a conjecture about it. With the idea of vermin potentially being the literal source of all stagnation or impurity for mankind, it's an interesting thing to consider because even if it is in the mind of the League members, we can't really doubt the veritability of the item descriptions, any one of them, because that kind of shoots us in the foot for trying to analyze yeah. all other portions of the yeah. lore. And unfortunately, in this instance, I'm pretty confident the description doesn't use kind of a suppositional language where it's like, it is said, or perhaps. Yeah. It's it's very explicit, which is kind of uh, annoying at times, because uh, sometimes things which you kind of take as a, a matter of course or for granted actually use that kind of suppositional language where you can cast doubt where you don't want there to be any doubt. But in this case, it, it does the opposite. So... If vermin do cause men to stagnate, that might create an environment for the Kagare within them to congeal at the bottom, from which uh, worse things might take root. So maybe the vermin themselves take root. And so if we go back to that idea of stagnation uh, that Sophie first presented, one of the ideas that I have in relation to that would be when we compare fluids in general, we first have like the idea of water. And if we take the idea that impurities sink to the bottom because they're the heaviest things that are within a fluid, that kind of goes as a matter of course. And so if we compare that, like the idea of water and blood and mercury to being layers that get closer and closer to the nightmare, I think that's kind of where that idea of vermin comes from and where that idea of stagnation and impurity kind of tie back into everything in the nightmares because the lake and the ocean rune say in order to access the arcane or the eldritch truth one must go beyond like the, the bounds of water essentially so to me that just means you need to go deeper and deeper through the impurity yeah and in the research hall they have the patients literally have their heads filled with water or some kinds of fluids yeah to bring them closer to that kind of nature from which they then begin to hear the dripping sounds, essentially. Yeah, yeah, and like the the way that like Cos is encountered at the, at the, at the shore. The mm -hmm. idea being like she's come in from the ocean. And then what interest, like I know it's a dream and it's a boss arena, but the fact that you can go out and just walk on the ocean, like the ocean's actually solid, but things can come out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also like potentially where we fight Ram, having a very similar appearance. Yeah, where, like, you're fighting Rom, and there's this implication that, like, you jumped in the lake, but you're actually in... What you're actually fighting in seems to be the reflection of the moon in the lake. Like, the reflection has become solid. It's, like, very strange, yeah. So, you know how the research hall patients have liquid in their heads? Yes. If the research assistants don't change that liquid, it's gonna stagnate. Yes. And if it stagnates, you're going to have vermin? Uh, potentially. Yeah. Do you get vermin in water is the question. I feel like um, the healing church might have done other things in addition to just like filling the heads up with water. I think there's a good chance. They say it's water and blood. Between like water and blood, I think there's also the chance yeah. they were experimenting with phantasms. Because when we look at all of the items in the research hall area, you get the black sky eye get the mm. the living failures 
Um, the, the kind of Enough rogues way. that the research hall patients are similar enough to me where I think that you could argue that the brain suckers might have had a relation to them because they have also oh, had like visions yeah. on the back of their heads. Yeah. The phantasms yeah. will pop out of them. Well, yeah, because because what happens is that like Adeline, her like revelation is the thing that you become the bed for the phantasms. Yes. So it looks like whatever happened in the research hall possibly led to like, okay, we need to experiment more with phantasms, depending on how you take Adeline, whether you think that happened in the real world. Yeah. Going with that idea, Adeline gets what is called the milkweed rune, but the Japanese yeah. word is Nayadoko, which means seedbed. That's what they yeah. call the bed of chaos. Bed That's of the chaos, same idea. Yeah. And that co- goes back into that idea of stagnant water being a seedbed for like vermin, I guess, like mosquitoes and centipedes that we've mentioned before. And going back to that idea of just, you know, regular base vermin in the research hall um, on the kind of right side of the research hall, there are a couple patients that do have similar movesets to scourge beasts. So it seems yeah, like yeah. they were experimenting with multiple kinds of ways to introduce the fluid into their heads. That's interesting because you find those patients are in this room and then that room is accessed by a ladder that goes up to where there's blood ministers and those blood ministers have beast blood pellets with them. So Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, this is the, because there's no beast. I mean, those patients qualify as beasts mechanically, but like there's no beast beasts in the research hall yet. Like we don't actually have like the full on beast explosion that we Mm -hmm. get later on. So you can see, oh, this is where they started. This is where they started experimenting, where they started to unlock, like, elements of beasthood within people, was when they were doing this stuff with the water. There's also an interesting mechanic, which is kind of easy to overlook. It's a little bit bugged with how they implemented it, but if you send the suspicious beggar to the imposter doctor, he will turn into a celestial emissary. So it seems like the celestial transformation can override the inherent beasthood within man which might tie into why we don't see so many beast type or vermin type patients within the research hall as well. Yeah, yeah. Last protagonist, earlier you mentioned that if your blood isn't pure, then you're more like the great ones. Yes. So you want your blood to be impure to communicate with great ones? Well, yes and no. One of the pitfalls of having more and more impure blood is not having a body that's physically able to withstand the effects of it. So as we look at all of the people within Yarnum who've taken the blood, almost all of them have transformed into beasts. So it seems to me the most likely way to get a body able to withstand that kind of uh, introduction of impurity would be being born with the genetic ability to absorb it. So. One of the ideas that I have is the two Marians were the first ones to refine the process of taking the blood and being able to create a civilization around it. But at the very end of that spectrum, once you become superhuman, it becomes harder to reproduce. And so instead of having normal children, they might just have children of blood. So normal people trying to get impure blood to become closer to the great ones seems to be Mostly an impossibility, and maybe it's only the hunter in the third umbilical cord ending that yeah. accesses it. So then creating the Celestials, could they be creating bodies that could possess that impure blood and not turn into beasts? Well, they certainly don't turn into beasts, but um, for what it's worth, the Celestial Emissary is counted as a great one in its trophy description. Okay, thank you. Can you please explain what a blood echo is? Blood echo, the term for it in Japanese is chi no ishi. And I I feel like the way that it's meant to work in Japanese is a little bit of a play on words. And so the ishi means kind of like the last will and testament, the the final hopes, dreams, and desires of a person. But these specific forms of ishi are chi, so they're, they're blood final wishes. So these are the final wishes within the blood. However, Ishii is a uh, homonym or homophone, I forget the actual term for it, that uh, shares the same pronunciation as Ishii, which is a uh, will is in willpower. So when you look at your HP stat, it's literally described as the um, desire or will to survive. So when you look at blood echoes, it's, it's literally a form of willpower that 
strengthens our character and it gives us the will to survive throughout the fight. So when we look at blood vials, I argue pretty much all of the blood is the same within like some differences between like how concentrated the echoes are within it. So when you take a blood vial, you're literally restoring your own will to survive with the wills of the dead, in my opinion. Right. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question for you. I'm going to paste something in your Discord, Last Protagonist. Okay. Can you read it out loud and explain to us what it means? Oh, so like Shino Kito, Kito which is like a, a battle of life and death. Or wait, actually, my Discord. Sorry, let me double check. Like, It's more like the will to fight, like the fighting spirit, kind of. Or will to death. I know what she sent you. <laughs> what is it? Dying will bullet. Yeah, yeah, good. It's really good. Also known as a like, thank you. desperation yeah. shot. Oh, I totally misread the last character. It's it's Shinu Kitama, so it's like death spear, death bullet. Wait, wait, wait. Kitama, it's like death energy bullet. <laughs> oh, death energy bullet. I like it. That's a good way to say it. Like the way they say it in English, it's a dying well bullet, and it's from an anime called Katekyo Hitman Reborn. <laughs> Sophie, could you please explain what a dying well bullet is and how it happens and under what circumstances? Thank you, Sin. I'm sure Lost Protagonist is really interested. So a dying will bullet is from the anime Katekyo Hitman Reborn. It's an anime that only Sin remembers but wants the whole channel to revolve around. <laughs> um, what happens is that there is, there is a no good high school student and there's a baby in a fedora who has a magic gun. No good high school student needs a bit of inspiration. The baby shoots him with the gun. The gun's got a dying will bullet in it. And then the kid's uh, clothes fall off and he yells, Reborn! And then he solves whatever problem uh, was in that episode. And every episode has the same has the same plot. Um, something <laughs> goes wrong and he gets shot by a baby. And there's 200 of them. And Sin wants us to watch all of them. And I... You forgot one important detail about the baby. How could you? Okay. Which 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 detail about the baby? He wears a suit. He has a fedora. Why does he have a gun? Why would a baby have a gun? Because he's a member of the mafia. Because <laughs> he's course. a member of the mafia. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sophie. so happy. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Sin's goal with this channel is that she will just make everything about reborn at some point. Get sponsored by him. I wish. Oh. <laughs> Sophie, do the outro. That was Kegare Part 1 with The Last Protagonist. Last Protagonist, if people want to find your channel, where can they go? They can go to YouTube and just type in Last Protagonist, two separate words, and you should be able to find my channel very easily. Or you can also look up Fear the Old Lore, hey. where I've been recently streaming uh, Dark Souls 1 Remastered, as I like to call it, Prepare to Lore Edition. Hey. Prepare to Lore? Yes. Oh, I God. also have a Prepare to Lore. You do? Oh my god, twinsies! <laughs> Except mine is way stupider than yours. <laughs> I'll send you an episode. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I've actually watched all your videos. Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah, I just turned on the playlist and it just plays and it's really good. It's really interesting. Your streams are really interesting as well. I've been quite a few of them. And I highly recommend your channel to everyone. But like I said, um, I'm sure everybody already knows yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I've enjoyed my time here. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Last Protagonist. Thank you both. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sen. And thank you everyone for listening and see y'all next time. Bye. 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 Ciao. 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 Ciao.